So what I'm going to do is I'm, <clears throat> I'm going to take you through a set of four questions. First being, what does it mean for a city to be smart? Uh, so that we have some basis of agreement there. Uh, and the second one is, <clears throat> what type of information architectures have been proposed to support smart cities? And so I really am going to talk a little bit about computer systems, et cetera. But I'm not going to do it in any real technical depth. But I want to do enough of it so that you have an idea of the terrible situation we're moving towards. Terrible, maybe that's a little strong. The, the, the bad situation that we're moving towards <clears throat> with respect to how we view the role of the city's information systems in running the city. Then based upon that understanding, I'm going to ask a question or attempt to ask a question, what are the requirements for an urban operating system? And finally, how should agents behave? Uh, in a smart city. And when I talk about agents, I'm really talking about computer-based agents, intelligent agents, AI agents, that type of stuff. So um, I'm coming at this from the perspective of a person who's been working uh, with organizations and cities and doing research in AI. I, I started doing work in AI back in 1975, so I've been at it for a fair amount of time. Um, so I'm, I'm really taking more of an AI lens on uh, smart cities and the issues around <clears throat> the, the, the system that will operate our cities going, uh, going into the future. And just as a side note, uh, we are having this meeting um, the day after one of the most momentous events occurred, which is the first pedestrian being killed by a, a um, What's the right word? Autonomous. See, I don't use autonomous. Autonomous connotes that the actual car can operate autonomously. I hate to, I'd hate to bit to it being that person to be the first pedestrian to be killed by a uh, misnamed autonomous vehicle. Um, <clears throat> and as a body count begins to grow, we'll start to be able to see cities and provinces and states begin to introduce legislation that actually constrains their use as opposed to the, uh, the Wild West that we're in at this particular time. Now you may think that's sort of a strange statement coming from a technology type person, an AI person, um, but I do it from the vantage point of actually understanding the technology and hence what its limitations are. Okay, let me return to smart cities. Um, there are many views of smart cities. It depends upon who you talk to. And so I'm going to give you three different views. I think it's three um, of what a smart city is. The first one is an engineering perspective. And I have to warn you, this perspective is pretty scary. Um, what this is, is a list of, of maybe 10% of the papers presented, the titles of 10% of the papers presented at the IEEE, the Institute for Electronic and Electrical Engineers, uh, conference on smart cities last year in Wuxi, China, in September, uh, to give you an idea of what the engineering world sort of views as research in smart cities. Because I think for those of you who are not into this side of engineering, uh, this would be an eye opener to you as to what people consider to be research in smart cities. Um, a fair assignment to drivers for parking lots. Uh, Brain-computer interface-based robotic arm control. Uh, stereoscopic image quality assessment via convolutional neural nets. Uh, implementing intelligent water loop heat pump control on cloud for sustainable buildings. So this stuff is is you know really down in the dirt. It's really into the nitty-gritty of engineering issues. Um, and if you were, if any of this is familiar to you. What you would extract from that is, is that the people who do research in smart cities within the engineering world have a very narrow focus, okay? And their focus is narrow for two reasons. One is that the problems that they're trying to solve are truly difficult, okay? There's no mats, there's no silver bullet. Um, and they're also shaped by the fact that within academe, uh, the discipline we're in shapes the nature of the research that we do so that we take a very narrowly defined problem and we try and solve it and expand. Anyway, that gives you one perspective on what people mean by smart city. Second one I'm going to give you is an ICT, uh, Information Communication Technology Perspective. So here's a quote from Cisco, 
It's the adoption of scalable solutions that take advantage of information communications technology to increase efficiencies, reduce costs, and enhance quality of life. Now, um, well, let me show you another one, and then we can uh, we can talk about uh, where these definitions come from. This is from IBM, collection management of the right kind of data, integration analysis of the data, optimization systems to achieve desired systems based uh, on insights gained through advanced data analysis. So basically, um, the, the big IT companies, whether it is IBM or Cisco or Microsoft or Tata Consultancy, they have a particular view of what smart systems, smart cities are, and they've been selling their perspective of smart cities to cities for at least 15 years now, okay? But if you, if you drink their Kool-Aid, their Kool-Aid is all about selling you more hardware and software. And then you get the social science perspective. Uh, Harrison 2014 says, cities or regions that seek to make the best use of knowledge and intelligence of citizens, administrators and service providers to improve the design, construction, and operation of cities in various ways. Um, do we see any mention of information or communication technology there? No, none whatsoever. Uh, Holland in 2008, territories with the high capacity for learning and innovation, which is built in the creativity of the population, their institutions, and knowledge production, and their digital infrastructure for communication. Digital infrastructure finally gets in there at the very last part of the last sentence. Okay, and then um, Cara Caraglio, however you pronounce it. 2009 says, see, define as smart with investments in human and social capital and traditional transport and modern ICT communications, fuel sustainable economic development, high quality of life, and wise management of natural resources. So there's a, very, there's a marked difference between what it is at the engineering side, which we can view as one end of the continuum, to the ICT side, to the social sciences side. Now, if you ask me personally where my leaning is, is the definition of smart cities, it is on the social, the social science perspective. Because for me, it's all about people and knowledge. Uh, and technology is just an enabler of things as opposed to the, it's a means to an end as opposed, as opposed to an end in of itself. Oh, and I have one more. Adding intelligent technology sensors data. Sorry, that doesn't fit in with the social science. Forget that one. Okay, now. For some reason, I didn't know when I was a graduate student that I would read things that were relevant to my career, the latter part of my career, or the late stage of my career, which has to do with cities. And so, in, while I was a graduate student, I read uh, uh, a book by Christopher Alexander. Um, and Christopher Alexander, for those of you who don't know, uh, an architect, uh, professor at Harvard, got his PhD in architecture or yes, I believe his PhD at Cambridge. And he wrote, a, his thesis was on the design of cities by hierarchical decomposition, okay? And so basically he was um, uh, inspired by Herb Simon uh, work on near decomposability of systems. And he said, you can go and look at the design of cities by decomposing them into parts and subparts and subparts. And near decomposability basically says the subparts don't really interact with other parts all that much. There's, there's, there's some degree of interaction, but not a whole lot. So decomposability actually works. And so then he was at some point in his career when Allende was president of Chile, Chile uh, was brought in to do a greenfield design of the city. He spent a year in Chile doing the design. He came back, he wrote a paper, and the paper is, the city is not a tree, okay? And so this was really the transition from theory to, to experience, from theory to reality, in that he finally recognized that near decomposability does not necessarily apply to the city, um, that all the different pieces of the city interact with each other. And one of the key things about, about cities is that the institutions, the physical structure, et cetera, serve multiple purposes. And the example that I, I use is, is a fountain. If you go and you look at a fountain uh, in Rome, what's the purpose of the fountain? Well, originally the purpose of the fountain is to provide water to the people in that area because they wouldn't, wouldn't have uh, plumbing um, hundreds of years ago. So the fountain is, is a source of water. It's also a source of uh, communication. 
uh, of news being related, of gossip, because people would go there and talk with each other. Uh, it's also a source of, of love, in the sense that you meet your, your spouse uh, by meeting at the fountain. And on and on and on. Um, that class of that fountain area yeah, performs, supports many functions. And the bottom line is, is that when we look at a city, um, we see that, that all the different parts of the city are interconnected. But we tend to view the design of the city and the management of the city from the old decomposability perspective. And it's like the blind person and the elephant, each blind person or blind people in the elephant, depending upon which part they touch, they think it's a different animal when in fact it's all part of an elephant. And the way we've dealt with cities is we've decomposed them into silos, and the silos don't interact that much. And what we now know is they all are interconnected, and we, when we do city design or redesign, we have to understand the nature of those interconnectedness, the multiple functions that places uh, uh, play in our life. Um, and so that brings us to the system perspective, which is the one that many people now adopt, is that uh, a, system is a, a city is composed of a system of systems acting as an organic whole with information technology providing an artificial nervous system. So that, I, in, in terms of my understanding of the smart system, there are really two layers of the definition of a smart system. One is a social science layer about taking advantage of human capital and social capital and all of that, using people to the best of their abilities, enabling them to learn, enabling them to accomplish things. And then at the, same, at the next level down, you're talking about an integrated system of systems where uh, all the pieces are interacting and communicating with each other. So that's what I mean by a city being smart. And a smart city is one that takes the best advantage and best care of the, the people and the knowledge, et cetera, that exists, and one that views the underlying systems that operate as an integrated whole. Um, so, any questions at this point? No? Okay. So, next thing. What type of information architectures have been proposed to smart, support smart cities? So, if you ever have the chance to go and read about information architectures, uh, for cities, you will see diagrams like this. This comes from smartcities.info. They break it up into modules. There's a collaboration service, a service enabler, an enterprise services bus, which information flows along, uh, operational services like notifying people of things, archiving, process choreography, business processes that, you know, if something occurs and you do A, then B, then C, uh, business to business services, messaging between businesses. Uh, so these are the types of things that they talk about within this particular information architecture. The IBM smart city architecture uh, is a little more structured and a little more low level technology oriented and they talk about buses that interconnect smart meters, cameras, intelligent sensors. And what I mean by buses is I mean information paths, connectivity, that information flows along. Uh, local analytics, unstructured data, uh, local, uh, event detection, and then time-dependent event handling, uh, workflow management, process control, and then another bus, and then you've got things like analytics, and device controlling, analysis rule base, uh, et cetera. And so this is sort of like the kitchen sink of all the buzzwords that you may run into over the last 15 years for uh, information technology as it relates to cities and organizations. And then uh, I, ISO JTC1 Working Group 11, which is the Smart Cities Working Group of the International Standards Organization Joint Technical Committee. Uh, this was actually motivated by the Chinese members of the working group. And it talks about data acquisition layer, a network communication layer, computing storage layer, data supporting, service supporting, uh, et cetera. So lots and lots of technologies, okay? Did your eyes glaze over? Okay, every time I look at one of these things, my eyes glaze over. 
okay? It's just a bunch of buzzwords thrown together for me, okay? And, and it serves one purpose that allows for people who are engineering oriented to agree, oh yeah, these are good buzzwords, we should include them. So you play the game of what's my favorite buzzword that's not included there so we can add it in. It also serves to obfuscate what is going on at the information and communication level of the city from the vast majority of people who inhabit the city, who develop policy, who worry about the delivery of operations, etc. Because anybody involved in that is going to look at this and say, I don't understand any of this. And the, the IS or IT department will say, don't worry about it. You don't have to. We take care of it. OK. Now, let's now change to what are the requirements for an urban operating system. First, what is an urban operating system? Why do I want to talk about an urban operating system? So I don't know if you've seen the book by Townsend on smart cities. It came out in 2013, so it's now five years old. And he just finds an urban operating system as handling tasks like processing your payment for a taxi fare, trafficking, uh, traffic road sensor readings up to a server in the cloud, verifying a resident's identity when they approach the door of the home, and as bits of the smart city interact with each other, then the operating system will broker their exchange. Okay? Now, Townsend is, is is technically oriented, but he's more non-technically oriented. And it sounds pretty good. Isn't this what our smart city should be? It should be enabling interactions. Da, 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 da. Uh, how? It doesn't tell us anything. But it sounds good. Here is the second one is what DeWall says, 2011. An urban option system is where data is fed into a system that aggregates its information in real time, can be used in different contexts, may lead to semantic knowledge bases. You can ask your informatics device questions like, what is the best place with regard to my current location, weather, and forecast? And that's their version of the urban operating system for smart cities. Well, we already have that, right? You go to Google, sorry, you get your iPhone or your Android, and you ask a question about, you know, where, what's the closest Chinese restaurant uh, to me? It will come up hopefully with an answer. A lot of these questions are becoming more answerable. Um, yeah, payment for a taxi fare. Uh, all this stuff doesn't really have much to do with the operation of the city. I mean, they're nice user-oriented apps, but I don't really think about it in an urban operating system point of view. What is this operating system that's going to run the city? And so here's another view. It's, it's um, from Tata Consultancy. I don't know if you know Tata Consultancy. It's the second largest IT consultant in the world. They have over 350,000 consultants. Um, they view the whole urban operating system in terms of shared data the ability of the different uh, parts of the city interacting with each other through the sharing of data. So for them, the underlying infrastructure is just about data and how it's shared. Okay, now we're finally getting to the point of what I think an urban operating system is all about and what the problem is that we're facing with the development of the urban operating system and the way we're doing it today. Let's imagine you work for Public Works and you want to pave a road. What do you do? You send out a tender or a, a request for quote, and it goes out to the oops, goes out to the different contractors out there. You get the bids, you get the proposals coming in. You choose the one that meets your satisfies your criteria. Okay, great. Is that all there is to paving a road in the city of Toronto? Think of it from an urban operating system point of view about how you're going to run the city. Well, first thing you want to know is if we're going to tear up the road, maybe we should ask the water department if they want to do something on that part of the road. 
Okay, so we want to coordinate with that, with the water department. We also want to ask the sewage part of the city. Is there anything that you need to do underground during the time that we're paving the road? You also want to ask the utilities, um, gas, electrical. Um, you want to find out from the permits department whether somehow during that period of time you think you're going to tear up the road, whether they've scheduled a parade there or a BIA uh, neighborhood fair or whatever the case may be. Uh, you want to contact the police to know if they know of anything that's going on or if they have the resources to assign uh, to that part of the city because the law says we've got to have police doing jobs at, okay, forget it. I'm not going to say um, You want to talk to the TTC. Do we have major transportation lines going through there? Do we have to reroute things? Do we, you know, what do we have to do? And we need to talk to the businesses because we can surely interrupt their businesses in ways that they're not happy about. And so the whole point is just this one single task is not restricted to that particular silo of public works. It affects many of the different silos that exist in the city. Okay? And so the key thing here is that any decision that occurs in one silo potentially has to be coordinated with all the other silos within the city. And that says that somehow we have to cooperatively solve problems with the other silos in the city. <clears throat> that changes the nature of how we think about the underlying urban operating system for a city. It says the urban operating system is not tell me where there's a parking spot, or not just. It's not tell me what the closest restaurant, or not just. There's a whole huge level there of problem solving that is cooperative across the different silos in the city that all the examples that people talk about with respect to smart cities and urban operating systems doesn't even address. But if you talk about having an efficient city, it's all about problem solving, doing it in a cooperative way across the different silos, and it goes back to the definition of a smart city, which is a integrated system of systems. How do we integrate all the different silos? And that's what is missing in the discussion, is the city is a system of systems and that providing services is a problem solving task that requires cooperation across the different silos. But instead, you don't get to see that in any of those smart city frameworks I showed you earlier. If you think back to those smart city frameworks, you don't really see anything about cooperative problem solving across the silos. Okay? And instead, what we end up having is, I don't know if people are old enough to remember Rube Goldberg, uh, but he used to make these diagrams of uh, physical systems that do nothing but uh, domino type things, pushing over dominoes. Um, but that's what's happening with the underlying layers within the city. The information underbelly of the city is there's all these different technologies that are being put in here. So, oh, we got to somehow communicate this to the people over here. Let's do something special. Okay, so that's this particular tube over here. Okay, and, and some other part of the city, oh, you know, we've got to do a better job of, of getting the police involved. Okay, so we'll put that pulley in there. And it's one band-aid over after another after another that goes into the city. Not to say that people in the IT department aren't doing a good job of trying to figure out how to get rid of the band-aids and put in other things that are better. <clears throat> but the types of things that we're trying to do in smart cities goes way beyond what people really anticipate in the underlying information infrastructures of the city. Now, the question then is, what do we need to do in order to build the urban operating system of a smart city? What do we need to do? Well, first of all, we need to recognize the smart city fallacy. And the smart city fallacy is viewing a city as something, a system we can control. Okay. If you're an engineer, you always view things in terms of your ability to control. Okay. 
Okay? Now, engineers are successful in their endeavors because they take they design out all the complicating factors. Okay, so I always talk about people thinking about uh, rocket science and brain surgery as being the most complicated areas that you can work in, uh, whereas cities are way more complicated. I mean, the neat thing about engineering is we design out all the complications. We redefine the problem so the complications aren't there. And then focus on what's left of the problem. Okay. Can't do that for a city. You know, if, if, if I was an engineer, you know, and, and transportation is a real problem, I'd say first thing is, can we design the city in such a way we don't need transportation? Okay, let's shove everybody into a 2,000 story building, okay, and then we'll just run a bunch of elevators and that's our transportation is solved. Okay, but that leaves out some other issues, so you don't have an engineer designing the city. <coughs> or at least optimizing for one uh, issue, which is transportation in that case. So the problem is, the smart city fallacy is, is we cannot view a city as a system we can control. And the reason why we can't control it is due to two things. One is complexity. We're dealing with extremely complex systems that we don't understand. And second is uncertainty. Things are changing all the time. You can't anticipate tomorrow. I was going to say tomorrow. I can't anticipate the next second, let alone tomorrow or the next week. Um, etc. I remember doing some work with Boeing uh, back in the 1980s, and, and they defined to me what a, a 747 is. Uh, anybody have a definition of 747? That's an airplane, right? Their definition at Boeing, people who design build this thing, is it's a million parts flying in close formation. <laughs> 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 that gives you an idea of how they view the strength of their engineering skills. Mm -hmm. I mean, and these are these are really good people in terms of plane design, et cetera, but they still view it that way. So what's a city? It's composed of millions of agents, that's people and software, and billions of activities operating in loose coordination according to a set of rules and laws imposed by society and subject to a set of laws not under our control. And that's the only way we actually get a city to work, is we have rules and laws and things like that that hopefully people will conform to. Uh, and if they do, that's great. And we have examples where that really works, like our roads. Driving would not work if we didn't have some basic rules of the road that we all conform to. If we don't have those rules of the road, or if you don't like them, then you move to Mumbai. Or you go to, let's see, where was I recently? Uh, yeah, well, Mumbai's a good example. Um, but the reality is, regardless of what rules and laws and other things you put in place, we always have Murphy's Law, okay, which dominates. What can't go wrong will go wrong. We have Moulton's Law, no battle plan survives contact with the enemy, so we can plan all we want, and there's still not going to be executed as well. Billings Law, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. We see this all the time in everything we have around us. Uh, and then my law, which is there will always be people who work the systems to their own benefit, or for every rule, there's someone who's ready to break it. Um, and these, these are the real laws uh, that exist within any system. And so the bottom line is, if we are to manage the complexity and uncertainty inherent in the city, we need a different way of thinking about the digital systems that increasingly operate and manage our cities. That's the point I want to make. And, and I didn't really know that I would be using this quote from myself uh, that I wrote in 1981 um, on uh, distributed systems way back then. Um, but that sort of sums it up. Um, but the key thing is that the operating system we're going to use to manage, operate, run the city will not be a rigidly engineered monolithic software architecture provided by a single vendor, nor will it just be a sea of services interacting via APIs, application protocol interfaces, as specified by rigid processes. Instead, it will be a network of intelligent agents interacting to achieve the goals of the city. Now, 
When I use the word intelligent, I'm using it somewhat loosely. Uh, it could be intelligent at this level of an IQ of 10. It could be intelligent at this level of an IQ of 150. Okay, we'll have everything in between in terms of the IQ of these different agents. And it's going to be related to the function that they perform. I'm going to skip over this slide. And take us to the next and final question. So if we are unable to control cities, if cities are uncontrollable due to uncertainty and complexity, what, how do we go about defining what the urban operating system is that is going to manage and operate our city? Well, I could have said, I'm going to show you another one of those diagrams that I did at the outset, but I don't think that's really the right way of thinking about it. I think the best way of thinking about it is from a behavioral perspective. Okay, what do I mean by that? First of all, you have to understand my view of the urban operating system today. That is fast becoming the primary means by which citizens and corporations interact with the city. Think about it. How often do you go down to City Hall? Who here has been to City Hall in the last week? Month? Okay, one person in the last month. Who here has perhaps interacted with the city directly or indirectly via some type of online system, either looking for information or, or whatever? We do every, I'm not saying anything that is brilliant or new to you. This is the way we operate today. Everything's done interactively via our app or it, it's, let me just say generally through the web, okay? So the urban operating system is not simply a tool, but the primary face of the city. Think about that. That's really the key uh, motivation for the slides that follow this, is that the urban operating system is the primary face of the city. It's how we all will interact or currently interact with the city. And the question I pose is how do we want to interact with the city? More importantly, how do we want the urban operating system to behave when the city and the urban operating system are the same thing? And that's really the key question. So the remainder of the slides is going to take a behavioral view of a smart city urban operating system. I'm going to go through four levels. One is awareness. What does it mean for an urban operating system to be aware? What does it mean for it to be responsive, adaptive, and accountable? Because we should no longer be thinking about the actual technology. We should no longer be thinking about, oh, can I make a reservation for a parking spot? We should be thinking in terms of what's the nature of the behavior that our urban operating system has to display if it is the city for all intents and purposes. Okay. And the message is really is even more important for people within the public policy area in the sense that, or let me put it more generally, social sciences area, in the sense that social sciences tend to leave the technology to the technologists and abdicate all responsibility for how this technology should be operated. And the, the best example of that is autonomous vehicles. Okay? Everybody has drunk the autonomous vehicle Kool-Aid. Because almost everybody believes that autonomous vehicles are within five years of being on the road. So there's this interesting statistic I learned about last July. Um, there's something called the mean time to intervention. And mean time to intervention is how many hours is it before the person in the driverless car, that is the person who's a driver but doesn't do anything, just monitors what the car is doing, has to intervene. Stop the car, make it swerve, or whatever it is, they have to intervene so that an accident or whatever happens. Doesn't happen. So as of last year, 
Uh, Uber was about a thousand hours mean time intervention. Uh, and uh, app, let's see, Amazon's car. Is it Amazon? No, Google's car. Google's car was 5,000 hours. And you think that's really terrific. 5,000 hours mean time to intervention. What's it for a human being? So what do I mean by that for a human being? If I had another human being sitting beside the driver, how many hours would go by before the second human being has to intervene to stop some type of accident? 1.2 million. Okay. That's the difference between where we are with autonomous vehicles and what people are capable of doing. Okay. So we've drunk the Kool-Aid. We actually believe that totally autonomous vehicles are just around the corner. And the reality is there are so many low probability things that can occur on the road with the vehicle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, with peoples and people and dogs and other cars and stuff like that, that we don't have the technology to the point that it can deal with all of the low probability events. And the only point at which we're going to realize that is when we have more and more autonomous vehicles on the road and the body count starts to rise. That's why the accident yesterday is very interesting because it's the start of the body count. And it's the start of the sensitization of government to that driving a, a ton of metal and plastic down the road at 30, 40 kilometers an hour is a very dangerous thing to do. Okay. So, let's not drink the Kool-Aid, but the question is, as a social scientist, how can a social scientist have an impact on how this whole smart city is going to evolve? What is it that you have to demand? And so, the first one I'm going to talk about, the first behavioral characteristic, is awareness. That's the first one. Expect the unexpected. And there are multiple levels of awareness that I've identified. One is the ability to sense. Second is standardization. Third is deviation detection. Fourth is pattern detection. Fifth is event prediction. Sixth is self-awareness. I'm going to go through each of these things. Okay, let's, let's talk about sensing. Well, you know what? Isn't it wonderful? The Internet of Things is here. And so everything's going to be sensed. Um, for me, the Internet of Things has been around for a while. Uh, so, I started my career at Carnegie Mellon, and when I was a graduate student there in 75, we had a Coke machine. I was in computer science, and we had a Coke machine which we hooked up to the Internet, or what was called the DARPAnet at that time. And we could sense whether each of the racks was empty or not, and how long, uh, when was the last time the, the Coke was put into each of the racks. And the reason for that is, is that our department was in a huge building, and depending upon where you were, it would take you maybe five, ten minutes to get down to the bowels of the building to go to the one Coke machine that will sell you a 16-ounce bottle for 35 cents or a quarter, okay? And, and as a computer scientist, we would live on Coca-Cola. So that machine was being, used, was being used all the time, 24 hours a day, and continuously being rebuilt. And you didn't want to walk down and discover that the coke that, that, that there was no coke or that the, the bottle that you got was, uh, was room temperature. <coughs> so we could actually access that machine over the internet back in 1975 and, and look at each of the racks and when it was last rebuilt, etc. So, uh, as I said, that was 1975. So, this whole internet of things is being... It's not a recent phenomenon, it's been ongoing for a long, long, long time. <laughs> um, anyway, there is a digitization in the city that's going on as we speak. Um, and it spans all aspects of the city. 
uh, sensors uh, are being attached. University of Chicago has an array of things that senses a variety of things uh, wherever the, the array of things is located. Um, a huge source of information for the city is the human sensor nets, that is you, uh, are part of the human sensor nets in which we are continuously reporting things to the city. Uh, 311 has an app where you can report potholes, graffiti, things of that nature. There are apps all around North America where you can report things to the city. Uh, and then there's the whole e-government digitization of service provisioning. So more and more of your interaction with the city are through the website if you want to go and book a swim lesson for your kid or a, a barbecue pit on uh, Toronto Island. Uh, all that's possible or become possible. Level two is data standardization. Uh, so in terms of awareness, it's one thing to be able to sense things. It's level one sensing. But if everybody represents the same thing different ways, i got a problem. I have no standard for the data that's being represented. And that's the nature of the world today, is all these devices, all these apps, etc., collect information, but the way they represent it is different. It's like each device is using a different language. One is in French, one is in English, another one's Italian, another one's Japanese. All different representations of the data different representations, but there is efforts underway to begin to standardize the representation of different types of data, whether it is social service related, financial related, 311 related, etc. Level three is deviation detection. <coughs> we sense things, we standardize the representation, the next level says, can we actually recognize deviations in real time? Uh, can we recognize uh, abnormal readings with sensors? Um, why is this of interest? Back when I was in my early days, 1981, Westinghouse asked me to design a system that diagnoses steam turbines and generators. There's about a thousand sensors on a turbine and a generator. And what I discovered uh, at the beginning of the project is that the sensors malfunction more than the uh, <laughs> more than the device itself, okay? And so if you if you believed what the sensors were reading, you had a real problem. And, you know, I thought, and so I actually published papers, got a patent on, on, uh, on a system for analyzing the sensors before using the output of the sensors to, to analyze the turbine generator. That goes way back, and, and interestingly enough, the system is still in use uh, now it's uh, Siemens, uh, over on at least a thousand turbines and generators around the world, much to my surprise. Um, but think about it. In this more Kool-Aid that we've all drunk, we actually believe that the sensors that we deploy, the things that read things that are deployed actually work. Now, coming from Toronto, reading about the Presto system, we know that that's not true. <laughs> yeah. Okay? But you think that London has their act, you know, together. So I was visiting some uh, colleagues in London. They were, they were going over their database of, uh, of uh, transportation data, especially the, the underground data. And I, the student who was going over says, you know what, I had some real problems with this data. I said, what's the nature of the problems? He says, well, <clears throat> number one, there are multiple trains with the same identifier. So train 1119 exists in two different places at the same time. Okay. Then the other problem is that the sensors tell me that the train is going east when in fact it's going west. Okay. And then there was a third problem which I've forgotten now. And then on top of that, the database that they had, that the city had of bus stops, omitted about a thousand bus stops in the city of London wasn't even in their database. So the bottom line is, if the engineering side of the world says, oh, we put these sensors in, they can read it, da, 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 uh, and you then rely upon that data, you got a real problem. Okay? There's a high probability that there's a lot, not a lot, but a certain level of error in the data that you're going to look at. So noticing deviations in sensors is important. 
uh, noticing deviations in service provisioning, running late, scheduled activity not being completed, noticing deviations in human, in human resource performance, governance, citizen requests not being responded to in time, finances exceeding budgets, knowing which deviations are significant, knowing who to contact when deviations occur, are part of this level three behavioral requirements that we need to think about. Level four awareness, pattern detection, analyzing the digital traces. And so digital trace is a term that we tend to use to talk about the traces you as a person or, or things leave in the digital cloud. And we all leave digital traces all the time. Okay, uh, That's why whenever anybody raises the privacy uh, concern with me, I laugh at them. I said, if you're concerned about privacy, you're about 15 years too late. Okay, uh, you th Everybody has thrown privacy out the door 15 years ago. Okay, so, I'm, and that's why I find the whole sidewalk lab uh, <laughs> discussion about privacy of a humorous discussion. I, not to say that privacy is important. I think privacy is important and we need to safeguard the data. Okay? Uh, but anybody who wants to get data about you will get data about you. Anyway, um, uh, level four awareness uh, has to do with analyzing digital traces, policing, identifying areas of concern, identifying uh, transportation uh, patterns such as bottlenecks, emergency response patterns, financial fraud detection patterns, uh, social service patterns, welfare abuse. Um, can we identify patterns? That's level four of awareness. That's the nature of the behavior that we want this system to have. So everything I'm talking about is not what the solution is, but it's what the behavior you want your urban operating system to display. Okay. We'll come back to this at the end. Level five awareness is event prediction, developing models uh, that can predict what events or behaviors are going to occur. And level six is being self-aware, analyzing the urban operating system's own behavior to identify security uh, issues, external attempts to hack the city, unauthorized access to information, uh, goals not being policy-related, goals not being achieved, governance activities that do not conform to city policy or violence. So this is the six levels of awareness. And when I talk about awareness, I'm talking about behavior in the urban operating system. And what I'm really talking about is what you should be expecting from any software provider, from any service provider, from anybody who's going to be delivering the urban smart city experience to you. That we as citizens, we as policymakers, we as academics should be asking the question, is the system behaving the way we want or not? And we should be demanding the right behavior. Let's look at responsiveness. <clears throat> I'm going to move rather quickly through this. Three levels, situationally aware, like we respond to it, logical. Um, situationally aware is the ability to access all information relevant to the situation being addressed. Uh, Chicago has a very interesting thing, application called Windy Grid, uh, which in their terms provides a story of a particular location at a given time. So basically when first responders pull up to an address, they not only know what the address is, but they know how many other times first responders have been called there. Uh, they have crime report information, 311 information, 911 information, so they have a better understanding of what's been going on in that area for the past whatever days, weeks, or months. <clears throat> so being situationally aware uh, is a first level of responsiveness. Now, why do we want situational awareness as part of responsiveness? Because if we as people, if we're the first responders who are pulling up, we want to respond in a way that's consistent with the situation. We don't want to go in guns drawn to somebody who has no history whatsoever of interactions with the police, has no history of violence, has no history of, you know, and that there are three kids that are lower than the age of 10. And I mean, you got to understand the situation in order to respond accordingly. Responsiveness two is flexibly respond. Um, 
which is a transition from a single rigid response to a set of alternatives that are situation dependent. Um, response to streets by Atkin is an interesting thing. Uh, very simplistic in terms of what I'm trying to talk about here, flexible response. But street lights that get brighter is visually impaired uh, pedestrians approach, signs that can announce their location out loud, street costume that gives extra time to elderly people, benches that hold down someone who needs a place to rest. These are just simple examples of, of city furniture, if you will, city uh, utilities, which has a higher, has a level of flexible response that's based upon the situation. And then the third level of responsiveness of behavior that we want is to be teleological. Teleological is a fancy word for goal-oriented. Um, the way we should be responding to situations is by addressing the goal. What is it that we want to achieve? As opposed to being process-oriented that basically says we use the same process regardless of what the outcome is that, that we're trying to achieve or the situation that we're so being teleological means you look at the situation, you look at who's involved, you look at where it is, you look at all those things. You say, what's the best way of achieving the goal as opposed to we have one process for responding? Okay. Third dimension of the behavior of the urban operating system is adaptive. And I'm going to talk about four levels. Uh, failure recognition, diagnosis, empowerment, and optimization. Failure recognition. An adaptive system of level one can actually recognize when it's failing, recognize that goals are not being achieved. What are the goals, methods, and resources? To what extent are they represented? Can you reason about it? This is more than indicators, which are simply metrics where people do the goal processing. So we have to move beyond just metrics. We have to understand what our goals are and whether they're actually being achieved. That's level one. Level two is diagnosis, diagnosing the root cause of performance. Why is it that we cannot achieve our goals? Now, I'm talking in human terms, okay? Um, but what I'm saying is these are the behaviors of the urban operating system. These are the behaviors that the urban operating system should be exhibiting, exhibiting. But we don't think like that yet. <clears throat> Assuming we have the information, digital traces, providence, causal relations, can we determine why something happened? Good examples are some work that was done in New York City in data analytics. 61% uh, of all sewer backups are caused by improperly disposed restaurant grease. Um, they were use, able to use data analytics to identify where the, data, where the grease was coming from. That's literally what it looks like in New York when they have a uh, grease block up in the sewage system. It actually pops the sewer, the manhole gun, and the grease comes out. And this is just simply due to the fact that there are restaurants that dump their grease down the uh, sewage system, as opposed to having taken away by licensed uh, <coughs> oil grease cell mower. And so they, they use a variety of, of information in terms of what businesses are in the area, what the type of businesses are, do they have per licenses, do they... Uh, do, do they have arrangements with companies that pick up the grease, et cetera, et cetera. <coughs> and then the third level is empowerment. Well, you know, it's sort of strange asking, saying we should empower our urban operating system because we tend not to empower people who work in the city. Now I'm talking about empowering the urban operating system. Well, oh, let's ignore the, the, the reality. But given the analysis of the situation, all relevant information, can we construct a better solution? And are we empowered to construct a better solution? Okay. That's a huge leap in behavior in these systems. And then level four of uh, being adaptive is optimization. The ability to construct better solutions and use those better solutions. Okay. Oops. Now I'm going to turn to the last behavior dimension, accountability. Cities must be held accountable for their actions. And to say that we have these information systems in place, and hence they can't be accountable, is unacceptable. Three levels of accountability, responsible, introspective, advocate. Let's talk about accountability, level one. 
an urban operating system is operating at level one of accountability if it is responsible. That is, it can determine why a particular outcome resulted, given a digital trace of information activities. What, um, do we have a digital trace? Can we determine what factors contribute to the situation and who is responsible? Okay, determining responsibility. That's the first level. Second, being introspective, second level. Determining why decisions were made. Were they honest mistakes, poor judgment, bias, <coughs> favor, treatment, conflicts of interest, difficult behavior? We, at level two, we can actually figure that out. <clears throat> and then level three uh, is advocate. Where is the digital ombudsman within the smart city urban operating system? Who is going to be our advocate? Uh, who will investigate when the city operating system is not doing what it's supposed to do? Ultimately, who's the system accountable to? What must they be? Who decides what they must be accountable for? Who decides how to respond to accountability issues? Okay, so those are the the four dimensions of behavior that I wanted to get to. And so in conclusion, let me repeat what I talked about earlier. Is the information architectures currently being proposed for smart cities are fundamentally flawed. Uncertainty, complexity require an architecture that can dynamically respond to ever to the ever-changing world in which we live. Let's skip this here. So to bring order to the potential chaos, intelligent agents must adhere to the code of behavior. So I'm using intelligent agents as a representative of different types of software that's being used within the city because I believe the whole city is going to be distributed software running on every day of any way. They must be designed not only to perform a function but to behave in a way that is smart, bringing harmony and accountability to the function of the city. And that basically says if we as citizens, if we as academics uh, want to have an impact on future of our city, or the urban operating system, is the city for all intents and purposes, then we have to start demanding behaviors from our urban operating system, from our smart city, that provides a degree of awareness, responsiveness, adaptiveness, and accountability. And if we don't create that manifesto of behavior now, we're going to end up with a city that doesn't provide the behaviors we as citizens need and deserve. <clears throat> Let me just close with a parting observation from Townsend who wrote that book on smart cities. Uh, the real killer app for smart cities, new technologies, is the survival of our species. The coming century of urbanization is humanity's last attempt to have our cake and eat it too, to double down on industrialization by redesigning the operating system of the last century to cope with the challenges of the coming. I don't believe that we even understand what the problem is that a lot of the solutions are. So the whole point of the urban behaviors that I'm talking about is to less, at least direct us down a path that allows technology to be innovative, but constrained to behave in a way that best needs best meets the needs of our citizens. So I'll end there.